Thank you so much. And thank you um, to the consortium for inviting us to share some great plant forward recipes with you all. As Mona mentioned, I'm Jacqueline Chi, Director of Programs and Special Projects um, for the Strate Strategic Initiatives Group at the Culinary Institute of America. Um, and my colleague, Tony Sakaguchi is here. Also, you'll see um, on Zoom that she's labeled CIA at Copia, um, but that is Tony. Hi, Tony. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so over uh, the next 45 minutes or so, we're going to be sharing a bit about how the Culinary Institute of America, um, also known as the CIA, though we focus more on deliciousness rather than espionage, um, how we're working to promote plant forage strategies for both public and planetary health. And hopefully by the end of the session, you'll have a good sense of how you can take these strategies and incorporate them into your own lives, as well as in your practice and with your patients. Um, give me just a second here to go to my PowerPoint here. Um, so I mentioned, um, and Mona mentioned also, that we are part of the Strategic Initiatives Group, which is the thought leadership arm of the Culinary Institute of America. And we work with professional chefs and executives in the food service industry on issues related to health and wellness and sustainability, as well as innovation and world cuisines. Um, we run a portfolio of industry conferences and retreats, again, mostly for professional chefs, although we do have one for medical professionals, which I will talk about in just a moment. Um, one of the initiatives in our portfolio is Menus of Change, which you'll you can see here on this slide, um, and Menus of Change focuses on the intersection of health, the environment, and the business of food. The work of Menus of Change is underpinned by the 24 principles of healthy, sustainable menus, which we have neatly summarized in this infographic that you see here. Um, I believe that you all have access to this presentation on the website, um, and we also have the infographic available for download and printing on our website, menusofchange.org. So I've been told that this is a pretty savvy audience when it comes to the link between human diets and the food system and climate change. I would expect nothing less of all of you. Um, so I've got a little quiz for you. Um, and I believe Clarissa is going to help me out here to launch the first poll. There we go, great. So actually we've got two polls here, as you can see. Um, and I guess actually it's a little bit more like a quiz rather than a poll. Um, but your first question is, on average, uh, one kilogram of beef produces how many equivalent kilograms of uh, CO2? Um, and the second question, um, you'll probably see what we're getting at here, but on average, one kilogram of cauliflower produces how many equivalent gram kilograms of carbon uh, dioxide of CO2? So I'll give just a little bit, um, a few more seconds for you to um, let me know what you think here. Um, it looks like there's some, uh, some people think one number over another. It looks like most, maybe I'll just give a final 10 seconds here. A few people who haven't yet voted, um, feel free to jump in there. And great, I think we've got, most people have had a chance now um, to go in. It looks like we've got these results. Most people thought that um, one kilogram of beef produces about uh, 30 kilograms of CO2. I'm afraid it's actually 60 kilograms, so twice as much. Um, and on average, one kilogram of cauliflower produces how many equivalent kilograms of CO2? You got this right. Uh, it's less than a kilogram, actually. It's, it's half of a kilogram. Um, thank you so much, Clarissa, for that poll um, or for running the poll. Um, so this one data point clearly demonstrates how eating more produce and plants instead of animal-based meat is better for our planet's health because it results in fewer um, greenhouse gas emissions, um, but also not to mention our personal health, our physical health, um, and there's plenty of other evidence um, around this concept of eating more produce and plants for both planetary and, uh, and personal health. Um, but what we've done in this infographic that you see here is translate that whole evidence base and combine it with culinary insight and strategies to give professional chefs concrete, actionable guidance. 
this is obviously a pretty complex issue. Um, so we actually have more detailed write-ups on each of these principles and the science that informs them on our website. Um, and this infographic just kind of boils it down and sometimes to simplify it further and tie it back to the title of this session, plant forward cooking, uh, we use the term plant forward. So I know that there are lots of terms thrown out about every which way, and it can be difficult to keep up with them, vegan versus vegetarian and plant-based versus plant-forward or plant-centric and flexitarians and omnivores and vegan on Mondays and all the different terms. Um, so just to level set, here's our definition of plant-forward. It's a style of cooking and eating that emphasizes and celebrates, but is not limited to plant-based foods, including fruits and vegetables, whole grains, beans, other legumes, and soy foods, nuts and seeds, plant oils and herbs and spices, and that reflects evidence-based principles of health and sustainability. So you'll see that this approach isn't limited to plant-based foods, which is to say that we don't exclude animal-based protein or meat, um, though plant forward certainly does encompass a vegan or vegetarian approach as well. Um, rather, we're trying to flip the narrative of meat at the center of the plate and instead emphasize and celebrate all of the amazing and delicious plants, including whole grains, beans, nuts, and seeds. Often, um, I think when we talk about eating plants, we kind of think about vegetables and fruits, but um, whole grains, nuts, seeds, those all come from plants. Um, and they don't usually get the spotlight or the special treatment. So what we're trying to do is really try to uplift and celebrate the incredible deliciousness of the plant kingdom. Now, I've been talking a lot about the work we do to help chefs and culinarians get on board with this plant board approach and make changes on their menus. But I hear you saying, Jackie, I'm not a chef. We're a group of medical professionals. What about us? Well, we think there's an incredible opportunity for doctors, nurses, nutritionists, and other medical professionals to be advising their patients on plant-forward eating and to be sharing these strategies with them, especially as it relates to improving health outcomes and mitigating obesity, heart disease, and other diet-related illnesses. But unfortunately, we also know that most medical education curricula fall short of appropriately arming medical professionals with the knowledge and the skills and the attitudes needed for appropriate nutrition care and nutrition counseling. Um, so to help bridge that gap, we partner with the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health Department of Nutrition each year uh, to host a CME conference for medical professionals, and that's called Healthy Kitchens, Healthy Lives, and we run it each year in February in the Napa Valley. What's especially unique about this conference is that you get all of the nutrition science and medical research, and you get to hear from other professionals putting this knowledge into practice, um, but you also get culinary demonstrations from professional chefs, just like Chef Tony here, um, as well as others in the industry, um, and an opportunity to both taste and cook recipes yourselves. We've got um, hands-on kitchen workshops where you can come into our beautiful kitchens at um, the CIA Copia and, and get a handle for what these, what it actually takes to produce these recipes. And then you get to take all of that knowledge back to your practice, um, but also you get all of those recipes to share with your patients or even maybe um, the chef within your healthcare or hospital food service operation to really spread this work even further. And as a thank you to those of you joining us this evening, uh, we're offering a special rate for our 2022 conference, which will be taking place February 2nd through the 4th. Um, if you register for Healthy Kitchens, Healthy Lives by June 1st and use this special code, Medical Society, um, we'll take 20% off your early bird registration rate for you. Um, you can register at our website, healthykitchens.org, and I believe there will also be a follow-up email after this meeting um, that will share this information again. Um, okay, but first we promised some cooking and that's what we're going to do. So I'm just going to show this final slide of our CIA at Copia facility in downtown Napa as a preview of where our Healthy Kitchens conference takes place. Um, but it's also, as I mentioned, where um, Chef Tony Sakaguchi is joining us from right now. And Tony is our real hero of the hour, again, about to show us all the deliciousness that can be coaxed from those plants. So Tony, um, I hear you're going to lead us on a world tour of cauliflower. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. So 
Um, what I was, what I'm going to do is I want to show you guys a really simple, easy dish. Um, it's called pop cumin and chili cauliflower. And what we're going to do is take that and turn it into three global delicious meals. And I always think it's one of those things where, you know, you don't want to cook every night. It takes a lot of time and energy and you're really busy. So why not make one thing that you can turn into three different meals that doesn't feel like you're eating leftovers all the time. That's so, yeah. So anyways, um, so the idea is to also talk about, you know, um, ways that you can um, through food to decrease your carbon footprint um, and also to give you ideas and hopefully inspire you to consider a plant forward or plant based diet. Okay, so um, I know Jackie kind of explained plant um, forward cuisine um, and it's something that many chefs are embracing at this time because for one, their health and they realize that as, as they're eating this way that they do feel better, but also for their customers too. And it's better for the bottom line actually also. And then supporting small farms, things like that and all the small farmers. So um, this dish is an example of just a really simple dish. You can eat it as a side dish or you could also turn it into three other items. So we're gonna um, start with um, a, a short video. And then after the video, I'm gonna prepare, um, we're gonna go to Mexico and I'm gonna take you to Mexico and we're gonna make some tacos using this as a filling. And then we're also, after that, we're going to go to India because I love Indian food. <laughs> and, um, and we're going to make a Frankie, which is basically, you know, they call it the Bombay burrito, but it's a, um, it's, it's basically an Indian burrito. Honestly, it's a street food that you would find in the restaurants that are specialized only in Frankie's and generally they're all plant forward. And then after that, we're going to go to the Mediterranean, Eastern Mediterranean or slash Middle East. Um, via California, and we're going to make a tartine uh, using this as a filling, and then also, but using flavors from the Eastern Mediterranean and um, and uh, the Middle East. And so it's, you know, most people are like, well, how can you do that with one dish? But really what it comes down to is a shared flavor profile. So um, they share the basic base ingredients um, in all these cuisines, and that's how you can take it, take a single dish and change it by just adjusting the sides and the condiments that you're serving and the sauces in order to come up with three delicious meals, you know, and I think that's the thing. It's when you're looking at healthy food, um, if it doesn't taste good, no one's going to eat it. You know, it's like, you could tell them, great, eat this. It's healthy. I mean, I remember that from the eighties and the nineties and everyone's like, no, it's going to taste horrible. So now it's like, we don't even think about what well, we do think about the health, but what we really think about is how can we make it delicious so that you want to eat it rather than feel like you're being forced to eat it. Okay, so let's go ahead and we can get started with the video. Um, I'm going to talk over. So the dish is this pop cumin and chili cauliflower. And um, the ingredients are really simple. It's uh, tomatoes and cauliflower, cilantro, chilies, cumin seeds, and canola oil. Okay, so you start with the canola oil in the pan. And then we're going to go ahead and we're going to add the cumin seeds. And you see how they're popping and toasting. Then we add the chilies and then the cauliflower goes in right after that. And so at this point, we're going to cook over medium heat. And I want you to notice how the cauliflower is starting to brown. And so you kind of wonder why is the, are the spices not burning? And really it's because there's enough moisture in the cauliflower if you're cooking on medium that it can kind of cook the cauliflower, roast it, and then um, get flavor. And then tomatoes go in and the tomatoes can be diced um, fresh ones or they can be canned. And you're gonna cook this down until it comes to this kind of a saucy consistency. So you'll see that it's, the tomatoes start to dissolve. They're kind of no longer holding their shape and they start to coat the cauliflower in this stuff. And then at the end, we throw in cilantro and then that's it. So that's our base dish, which is the pop cumin and chili cauliflower. And uh, we're gonna go ahead Sorry, we're going to go ahead and turn this into a taco, a um, Frankie, and then a tartine. Okay. So with this, um, so I have Tony, my... Sorry, yeah. if I can just jump in. I just wanted to let people know also um, that in Zoom, you can um, go to the view button and hit um, speaker view so that you can see Tony just a little bit bigger. There's lots going on on this stage and, and in Tony's kitchen. So want to make sure that everybody can get a bigger view of Tony. 
And oh, and I was also going to say that I think we're going to post um, the recipes um, that Tony is doing right now in the chat. And um, I think maybe they're on the website also. So if you'd like to follow along with the recipes, they're going to be there for you. Okay. I'll let you go oh. now, Tony. <laughs> and I was going to say, feel free to ask any questions that you yes. have. Yeah. And if I start to talk too fast, then just say, hey, slow down. <laughs> yes, so, feel free to. I get um, so excited about cooking. I'll be, <laughs> so. I'll be keeping an eye on the um, chat. Um, uh, so if you have questions as you go along, feel free to put those questions in the chat and then we can we can stop Tony from her her roll, runaway train and and get those questions answered. Okay, so first thing we're going to do is make the tacos. So um, the ingredients for the tacos are I have some, I have some corn tortillas here. Um, and, you know, I would say, you know, use corn um, and you can either buy them or you can make them. And then we have um, some black beans and the black beans are just pureed. So it's a puree of black beans. Um, they were cooked with a little bit of onions. So their onions were caramelized, some chilies in there and then pureed until smooth. You know, and I think one of the things about this dish is that you, I, I don't want you to feel like, oh, well, I don't have, pure, I don't, I don't want to puree my beans, so I can't make it. You know, really, there's a lot of flexibility. And I think you have to look at food as, you know, that you can, you look at what you have, and then you kind of figure out, well, what can I do with it? And sometimes it, you can't do exactly what the recipe calls for, but you can modify. So if you have the black beans, and you, and you could use whole beans if you wanted to, just cook with a little bit of spice. You could do pinto beans, you could do white beans, you could do whatever beans you have in your cupboard um, to, to do this. And I think the goal is if you have the beans in there and you have the corn, then you get your complete protein. Okay, the other ingredients that we have are the cumin and chili cauliflower, which is in the pan here. And I'm gonna use this for all the dishes today um, and stuff. And then also we're gonna do a salsa and then avocado. So I wanted to show you how to make a really simple salsa because I feel like salsas are so easy to make that you know you don't have to go to the market and buy it. You could just grab a few ingredients, make enough for what you need for the day or for tomorrow. Or you know I love these this salsa when you have extra salsa, you just turn it into another dish. But that's a whole nother demo. <laughs> so so but anyway, salsas are really simple. So this is a tomatillo salsa, and um, so this is I. I cut my tomatillos up and I was just carried away. So, um, but they look like little tomatoes, you know, so, and they usually have a husk on the outside. Um, and then when you open them up, they're solid, you know, they don't have the seed cavities that you would see inside of, um, you know, like a tomato. They're in the nightshade family um, rather than uh, with tomatoes. Okay, so we're gonna take these and we're gonna put them in the blender. Okay, and I cut them up so that they would catch in the blades. You can't throw, if you throw them in whole, you're gonna find generally that um, it just takes more time to get it to puree. And we're gonna go ahead and blend this and I'm gonna throw some chilies in. So I have some jalapenos and what I'll tell you on chilies is you should always taste them before you go ahead and just say, okay, it says one chili, I'm gonna throw it in. Um, because chilies will vary in terms of the intensity of the heat, depending on how they were grown also how old they are, you know, how long were they in the market, that will decrease the amount of heat that they have. Um, and also the type of chili, they all hit your palate very differently in terms of a jalapeno versus a serrano versus a Thai bird. Okay, so, but taste your chilies. And this one was not really hot, it was kind of mild. So I'm gonna go with all of it, okay? And we're gonna blend this. Okay, so you can either blend it till it's smooth or you can leave it a little chunky. So I took it till it's fairly smooth. Um, I'm gonna move this out of the way. And then um, what we're gonna do is stir in our onions, cilantro and lime juice. Okay, so in terms of the amount of lime juice that you're gonna add, you really should taste this because you're gonna find that Tomatillos, depending on the time of the year, can be acidic or kind of plain. So you want to make sure that you uh, taste it so you know how much of the lime juice to add. Okay. And they are not very tart. So I'm going to add some salt in. Okay. We're going to add our onions in, cilantro, and lime. Okay. And what I'll say is that with the, um, with the salsa, took what, a minute maybe to make? Um, 
but you know, really quick and easy. You could do the same thing with tomatoes if you wanted to, uh, to make a tomato salsa. And things that I like to do with the salsa when, if it's left over is to, you know, you could make a tinga or you could turn it into chilaquiles or, you know, eat it with your egg in the morning. Okay, so that's our salsa. Tony, we've actually got a question about the um, cauliflower, the base, the cauliflower base. Um, thank you, Rebecca, for your question. Rebecca's asking, can you use ground cumin instead of cumin seeds? Um, and also, what kind of chili do you recommend for non-spicy eaters? Um, she was asking if you could use a red pepper instead. Yeah, I mean, you can you can use um, you could use a red pepper instead or a green pepper. Um, the green bell pepper will actually, if you were to take a jalapeno and, and be really careful and not cut into the center cavity, it tastes like a green bell pepper. So, um, so that would be fine to use. And then in terms of ground cumin, if you use the ground cumin, I would suggest it goes in later. So I would probably brown the cauliflower first and then go ahead and add the tomatoes and then add the cumin around maybe um, when the tomatoes are cooking down so that cumin gets a chance to cook out a little bit. Um, yeah, so that you could use it you could use ground also. It just would go in a different time, okay? Okay, so to assemble the ta um, tacos, we're gonna just heat the tortillas on a hot grill, okay? And then I have my black beans that are hot. I have my cauliflower that is warm also. Okay, and let's say I'm sticking. <laughs> kind of warm them. And really, you know, you don't want to get them too dry. You want them kind of moist and, uh, you know, you want to heat them so much that they lose their moisture. Okay, we'll put these down. Take our beans that are nice and hot. Okay. We're just going to give it a tiny bit of the beans on here. Tony, we've got another question from Mary Etta. She's asking, um, can another type of oil, for instance, avocado oil, be substituted for canola oil in the recipe? Okay, so um, that one's kind of, okay. So with that question, here's what I'd say on oils is that some oils are meant to um, be more of a seasoning than they are to cook in. So with avocado oil, I think you have to look at the smoke point and I think it's rather low. So if the smoke point is too low, you don't want to cook with it because then it starts to break down too early and you lose all those special qualities about it in terms of the flavor of the avocado oil. So um, that's why I would tend to go with a more neutral oil um, in terms of in the beginning of the cooking. Um, if you wanted to finish it with a little bit of oil, um, the avocado oil would probably be really delicious. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and put um, some of the top cumin and cauliflower on here. Okay, so. And also, you know, with this, um, for the, uh, the cauliflower, I use most of the core also, because I kind of feel like the best thing about cauliflower is that you can, um, you can use most of it. You know, you just trim off a little bit of the core on the end and, um, and then you're good to go. Okay, and then I have an avocado. I'm gonna put a couple slices. So um, with avocados, when you, when you go ahead and you are cutting them open, never put it in your hand and whack it, because that's how I got my first job. I was replacing the guy who cut through the avocado seed um, and had to get stitches. So don't do it that way. I usually will cut around like this and then you could um, either peel the exterior off or I'm just gonna kind of cut it like this, peel this off and then I can go ahead and slice. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and slice. And here's the thing, if your avocados don't look good, then chop them up and use it that way instead, okay? So on the tacos, we have our black beans, we have our cauliflower, we're gonna put a little bit of the salsa on top. Okay, we're gonna to top it with an avocado slice. And then give it a little bit of cilantro just for garnish. Okay, so that is our hot chili and um, cumin cauliflower. Okay, so. Now we're gonna head to the uh, Mediterranean. Let me clear off just a little bit. And, sorry, to India. Gotta go to India now. Okay. And we are going to make our Frankie. And the Frankie is gonna be um, 
with, um, you know, it's similar to a burrito in the sense I'm going to use the whole wheat tortilla or a paratha. And then what we're going to do is, but we're going to add egg to it. And so that's one of the things that sets a Frankie um, aside from um, if you were to look at a, um, a burrito. Okay, so we have, um, and the ingredients in this are going to be lime onions. We have um, a green chili salsa uh, chutney, a tamarind chutney, yogurt, and ah, our cauliflower. Okay, so I want to show you really quick how to make the chutney because it's really simple. So, you know, we went over a quick salsa. Here's a quick chutney. And <laughs> my husband would laugh if he saw me using this. He's a chef too. So he would laugh if I was using a magic bullet. But the thing is, it's like perfect for small amounts of making something. You know, so I have my cilantro. I have my mint in here. I'm going to add my ginger, my chilies, water, and then lime, lemon juice. I'm going to throw this on here and blend it. Let it go. Okay. And then And that's it, you know, because I mean, I love this thing and <laughs> because you can do a small amount of a salt of a chutney in here, because if I were to do it in a blender, I have to do a lot more than what I actually need. So that's one of the reasons I like this. I'm going to give it a pinch of salt and then I'm going to go ahead and it's good to go. OK, so that is my green chili chutney. OK, all right, so. Next thing we're going to do, I want to show you some lime onions. So lime onions, you know, when you look at the, um, what we just did for the taco, so we had a tortilla, we had um, some beans in there. And so we're going to use lentils in this. So I have some lentils here that were cooked. Um, we had salsa, so we're going to use chutneys instead. And then in terms of the richness of this dish, we're going to use some, um, something that I call um, lime onions. So it's red onions that are salted like this. You know, so you can see they've kind of wilted. So they sat for about five minutes. There's some liquid that comes out of them as they sit. And so, um, and then what you do is you add lime juice and herbs, okay? So, and this is what it looks like after it's sat for probably 10, 15 minutes, okay? So they kind of wilt down um, and they get slightly pickled. And you could also, you know, not even eat these today, eat them tomorrow and they would still be delicious. Okay, so I would just take this throw the spice, the herbs in here, add the lemon, the lemon juice, and then that would be it. And that's our lime onions. Okay. And then the next part of this dish, the other chutney we're going to serve with it is a tamarind chutney. We have some yogurt that we'll serve with it also on the side. And then um, the tortilla and the egg. Okay. So let's go ahead and make this one. Okay. So With this, this one requires that you heat the tortilla or the paratha. And then we're going to go ahead and so we're going to heat this up. We're going to put a little egg on the outside and then we're going to flip it over and let the eggs cook for just a second. Okay, so here we have whole wheat tortillas. Um, we're going to heat the pan up. This needs a second. Okay, and we're just trying to warm this. Everything else is warm, so it'll be ready to assemble. I'm going to move this to the right. Okay. Great. All right. So throw this in. Okay. And then the egg that I have is just lightly beaten. I gave it a pinch of salt, and you can see that as it sit, it kind of breaks down just a tiny bit. So um, get a tiny bit more on this side. And let's see. And then the lentils that I have were just cooked with a little bit of, um, they were cooked with just in some vegetable stock, or you could use water with some herbs and herbs and uh, garlic in there. So just a hunk of garlic, um, some thyme sprigs, and that was it. Okay, so this is getting warm. So now we're going to take this, we're going to put a tiny bit of egg 
on this side. Okay, and then flip it over. And then you just give it a second to cook right there. Okay, I can walk to the sink and be back. <laughs> All right. Okay. Oh. Okay, and so that's the egg coating on the exterior of the Frankie. Okay, and so let's go ahead and we'll put this together. We're going to do, um, let's see, egg side down. We're going to put some of the um, lentils down here. And, you know, if you didn't have lentils and you didn't want to cook them, just use beans. You could use white beans or chickpeas or, you know, red beans or whatever beans you want to. Um, we're going to put some of the cauliflower in here too. Okay. And then we're going to go ahead and add our lime onion. Oh, sorry. I want to do the chutneys first, the lime onions last. Okay. So we're going to do a little bit of the um, Cameron chutney. You could use whatever chutney you have it that, you know, that you can buy in the market. It, um, you know, I would, you could get mango chutney or um, anything really. Um, I usually like to use two types, like a really, kind of rich one, like the, the tamarind chutney, it's kind of sweet and sour. Um, and then also, and savory also, because it has some cumin in it. And then I like to use the um, green chili one because it's really bright green and fresh. Okay, and then we're gonna put our lime onions in here. And what the lime onions do is they add a little bit of crunch and a tiny bit of acidity from the um, acid that's in the onion. Okay, then you roll this up like a burrito. Okay, oops, and that is, our Frankie, and when you serve it, you're going to serve it wrapped. Hopefully, not make a mess. You're going to roll it up. Okay. Let's see, and tuck under. So that's our our Frankie. Oops, I'm going to go this way. Our Frankie, and then we're going to serve it with some yogurt and then a little bit of the chutney. So we'll do a tiny bit of the green chili chutney if you wanted to add more to it and a little bit of the tamarind chutney. So that's your Frankie. So that's your um, Indian burrito. Okay, we'll move this over here. That looks amazing, Tony. Um, we have a question about the purpose of the egg on the, um, on the tortillas. And is there a substitute to offer for vegans or those that don't eat egg? Um, you know, the egg, I think, was is in there just to add some protein to it um, and maybe some, some texture. Uh, so I think if you were going to skip it, I mean, you could probably not even put something on there if you wanted to. I, I can't really um, think of a good substitute for that one. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's primarily there for a little bit of the texture, but also the protein to be added to it. All right, so the last place we're going is, um, well, we're gonna come to California. <laughs> we're gonna go via the, the Mediterranean. Okay, so this is the tartine. And tartines are just great ways to use. I always think of it as something as, you need a quick, easy meal, and you wanna have something that seems special for brunch, uh, and you're just kind of scrounging through your fridge to see what you have. So it's kind of like, let's put something on toast. All right. Let's see, so that, and we're gonna need some avocado again. Okay, so for this, um, it's really quite simple. Um, we're gonna take the, um, a piece of bread. And so this is the whole grain sprouted bread. Um, you can see the white part in here, and that's basically sprouted grains that are cooked into the bread. And it's been lightly grilled so that, um, and, so, and then and toasted so that it's kind of firm, not necessarily too soft. Okay, so, um, and you don't want to do this way in advance. You probably want to do it closer to when you're going to serve. And then what I like to do with this is just take a clove of garlic and gently go across it like that. That's it. You don't have to rub it in, you know, what it does to, to uh, you know, rub it with garlic. You just want to do a quick swipe because if you go too much, you end up with a really strong overpowering garlic flavor and then no one wants to talk to you because they can't be close to you. Um, but if you don't, it, but if you do just a tiny bit, it gives you a little bit of this kind of 
sharp garlic flavor that really enhances everything else going on this, like the hummus and the cauliflower just adds another dimension. Okay. And then we're going to go ahead and we're going to add a tiny bit of olive oil to this, you know, so, and this is, you know, when you talk about the avocado oil, this is a good example of a way to use that kind of oil where it's more for seasoning and flavor than it is for cooking, you know, because so no heat applied, you use a nice olive oil to add another dimension to the toast. Okay. Then what we'll do is for this one, we have hummus. Okay, so, um, you know, really, um, you can either buy it, I mean, because everyone sells hummus now, um, or if you have a can of chickpeas, you could make it, you know, it's basically pureed chickpeas with um, a little bit of garlic in it. You add tahini to it um, and then some cumin, but it kind of depends on who, who you talk to because some people add cumin and other people will be like, you never add cumin. <laughs> so pick your battles. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna spread some of the hummus on here. Okay, and then, um, and I usually like to do kind of a decent layer uh, you don't want to make it too thick because then when you bite into it, everything just kind of oozes. So you don't want to have too much, but you want to have enough where you're going to get some in every bite. This is one thing that Susan Fenneger uh, used to tell me. Make sure that there's, when you're spreading something on bread, it has to go on every single open, you know, uh, anything, every single space of the bread. Like you can't have an open uh, corner showing or anything because then when you bite into it, you just wouldn't get that. Okay, so we're going to put some avocado on here. and so. If your avocado is not great looking, like mine is right here, um, you could chop it up and uh, just toss it with a little bit of lemon or something like that, and then uh, use that portion instead. Um, yeah, because I feel like with avocados, you kind of never know what you're gonna get um, until you open it up. And then sometimes you're happy and other times you're not so happy. Okay, so I'm gonna use some of my other pieces over here. I'm cheating, okay. And then what we're going to do is give it a tiny bit of salt and pepper. And the only reason I'm doing that is because the avocado is plain and it's very rich. And so this way it gets seasoned because there's probably, because I made the hummus and I know that if there might be not enough seasoning in there to carry over. Okay. So then we're going to take our hot cumin and chili cauliflower. I'm going to put this on top. You know, it wants to roll away. And you just kind of lightly press it in. And you know, one of the reasons that I think of food this way is because, okay, so my husband is also a chef, um, but he hates leftovers. He, you know, it, that's been like the struggle through the last 30 years. Because um, I love leftovers because we used to eat them when I was a kid, but his mom, they never ate leftovers. And so, um, so it's always kind of the, how can I make this, uh, not taste like he's eating leftovers. So if I change the flavor profile and I take it somewhere else, then it's usually a good way to get them to eat and not plain. <laughs> so, okay, so now I'm gonna go ahead. I just totally dished on my husband. Um, I'm gonna give it a tiny bit of lime juice. Okay. And, um, and what that does is because the avocados are rich and the hummus is rich, I'm gonna add a little bit of acid so it kind of balances that out in the cauliflower. And then we're going to finish it with a little bit of feta cheese. Um, you know, you don't have to add too much. And you could skip the feta cheese if you didn't want to have the cheese on here because um, there's enough flavor um, with everything else on there. And then we're going to finish it with a little bit of a spice called za'atar. And so za'atar is um, a uh, Middle Eastern spice. Um, you'll usually find that it has sumac in it, which is kind of a souring spice along with thyme and... Um, dry thyme or um, wild thyme and sesame seed. And so um, you add this in, it just adds a little bit of an earthiness to it. So we're just gonna sprinkle a little bit on top. And if you didn't have the za'atar, I'd say you could do probably a little bit of, a, uh, of um, sorry, you could do a little bit of dry thyme and toasted sesame seeds, and maybe a tiny bit more acid on here or lemon just to give it a little more um, dimension. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and Garnish with a little bit of cilantro, and then we'll give it a quick cut, cut up. Okay, and we'll serve this with. I was I was going to put this with a little bit of a side salad, just so um, you can see kind of a plate. And so with this, you know, um, 
I just thought, you know, I cook garlic in oil because inevitably you buy it, you get a clove of garlic, and if you don't use it all, then you're going to find that it starts to sprout. But a good way to hold on to it is to cook it in olive oil, you know, slice it and cook it in olive oil so that it kind of, it infuses the oil and then you have this garlicky oil, but then also you can use all the um, sliced garlic. It's nice and soft and tender. So we're going to mix it in with our green beans, tomatoes, and parsley. Okay, give it a pinch of salt. You could give it a tiny bit of lemon if you wanted to, um, or if you wanted, you could throw a tiny bit of cheese in here too. But, or you could just leave it without any acid. And we'll go ahead and we'll plate this up. So we have our tartine here. Okay, and we'll do our little bit of salad here. And as Chef Tony is um, finishing up with this, I think we're actually just coming up on time. If anybody has any last questions, um, maybe we have time for one more question for Chef Tony. Oh, we do have a question from Samantha, Tony. Um, how long can you keep the cooked garlic for? Oh, you know, I, you could keep it for a couple of weeks as long as it's in the refrigerator, you know, and the oil will last even longer. You know, so it will hold on, oops, it will hold up for, um, for a while, um, as long as you keep it in the fridge. But if you have it, you don't leave it room temperature because then that can cause problems. You would end up, sometimes you'll find that there's issues with botulism and stuff and um, garlic sitting out with, in oil. Okay, so, um, let's see. So here's, sorry, I have this kind of a mess going on here. Okay, so there's your Frankie, your tacos, and your tartine, okay? But anyways, you know, I think, you know, one of the goals is to, you know, food waste is one of the biggest issues in the, third, in the sense that one third of all food that's produced is wasted and along with all the energies and resources that took to produce it. So if you can eat, um, you know, don't waste food for one, you know, utilize everything, utilize the core of the cauliflower, utilize the peels of your carrots, the tops of your radishes and stuff. And then also eat a plant forward diet because that also is much better for the um, for the uh, your health, but also for the environment. It's much more sustainable. Okay. Any Absolutely. other questions? Absolutely, I think we are at time, and I'm just going to throw up this last slide here. Um, that if you do have any additional questions, please do feel free to reach out to myself or to Tony. Um, hopefully, we'll see you at our Healthy Kitchens, Healthy Lives conference in February. Again, you've got the recipes um, linked here in the chat as well as on uh, the website under resources, I think. And just thank you again so much to the consortium for letting us join you this evening.